And this is, an, this is a quote from, um, from James Leonard. Yes, I am an atheist. I was raised by a wonderful, open-minded parents who did not subscribe to a particular religion and who did not go to church. In my younger years, I believed in God simply because that's what everyone else seemed to believe. After years of thinking, reading, and questioning, I have come to the belief that there is no God, and I am comfortable with that belief and all of its ramifications. Whoever was behind this ad launched their attack in total anonymity, possibly even violating political campaign finance laws to do it. That's not character as far as I'm concerned. I have never kept my beliefs a secret, but as a candidate I have felt in my heart that this was a non-issue. I believe that r what religion a person follows has no bearing on their qualifications for public office, and that I have never, for, for, therefore never sought to make an issue out of my non-belief. And it's worth mentioning the local paper, the Patterson Irrigator, had some information. Irrigator? The Irrigator. That's awesome. <laughs> so I, I guess it's a, a dry region. Um, um, Water is the most important commodity. Yes. Um, they have some information on who might have sent out the mailer. The creator of the mailer tried to place the same advertisement in the Irrigator earlier this month. The person identified them, him or herself as Tom Jefferson. Of Clearly course. their real name. That's a great name. Um, emailed Original. the newspaper on October 5th about running a half-page political ad in the newspaper. The irrigator responded that they would need full contact information before they could run the ad. An unknown woman then dropped off $306.15 in cash for the advertisement later that afternoon. Weird. But the advertisement did not receive a copy of the ad until later that evening. The irrigator chose not to run the advertisement after running it, as the newspaper was not, apparently not aware of who produced it. The person who produced the advertisement and gave it to the newspaper has not yet received, retrieved the money that they paid for it. <laughs> and if the person does not do so, the irrigator publisher Bob Matthews said the new paper will simply return the money over to the state. That's interesting. So yeah. they're, they're not even willing to stand up in public and say, right. I'm, I'm a bigot against atheists or something. Right. They shouldn't be allowed to hold public office. Anyways, we actually do have a caller, uh, Majid from Kirkland. How are you doing today? Yes, fine. Thanks so much. I'm just calling to say that uh, I really uh, appreciate the way you are talking to people and uh, giving them information. And, uh, but in our country, Iran... Uh, not only religion is running everything, but uh, they are uh, killing people. Oh, they yes. are torturing people. They are really destroying the country. Absolutely. And uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the Middle uh, Ages of uh, the religion's power. Anytime religion gets into power, that is the end of a nation. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, and, I think, uh, and I think that I that's really, really appreciate what you are doing. Oh, I, and, I appreciate uh, it too. Um, I'm I, I sure in in this country, uh, we were lucky that we came here. In this country, also there are religious people who uh, try uh, to meddle into the government affairs. But Absolutely. Fortunately, you have it in your constitution that it should be separate. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you totally understand it, Majid, and that's, I think, the beauty and why we, as you know, some of us who are Americans, who, who really, obviously, we've lived here, maybe we've been elsewhere. The, one of the things that you can love about this country, despite all of its flaws, is the fact that it, it's a place that allows, uh, that allows people to have different beliefs and for that not to be a liability for their life or their freedom or their family's safety. Because I, th I think that's really what the definition of freedom is, where it's safe to be different. Um, where you can simply, like you said, people are killed over this sort of stuff, and it's, it's insane. And I think that a lot of times people who are in, I, I have something I tend to refer to as majoritarian arrogance, that somebody's in the majority, whether they're a Muslim in the Middle East or a Christian in the United States, don't really appreciate church-state separation because they're so used to just having their way on everything. Mm. And uh, they're, they're so used to their beliefs basically being forced upon people as the default that they just get sort of angry and defensive whenever anyone else wants to affirm the same rights to express themselves as they do. Yeah, they don't allow it. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because they'll, they'll want to have like a prayer before a city council meeting, but if it's a prayer from a different religion, usually the people that are most gung-ho about pushing their own prayer are the first ones to basically throw a fit if somebody else wants that same right. Right. That is true. I hope I hope one day we can get the same freedom uh, as you 
have it here regarding the religion. I because, hope so. Uh, a lot of people are really suffering. Millions of people yeah. are suffering in, uh, that's in our country right now. It per, greater All Persia the educated is people are suffering, and they are, most of them are in prison under torture. Yeah, that's scary. If you say you don't believe in God, that's the end of your life. Right. Yeah. They kill you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear the, this perspective, Majid, because uh, uh, Iran is one of, for me personally, is one of the most fascinating places on the planet because of so much of um, the history of Western civilization was uh, has has taken place through through there directly or indirectly, and it's a great tragedy that because of the way that uh, because of the way that certain political or or ideological forces have made it so, our country has to be at, at such at odds with them, and also their state happens to be at odds with the people within their own country. Um, so yes, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't share s sort of George Bush's messianic vision about the spread of democracy making everyone free, but I certainly do hope for a resolution sometime in the next few decades that opens, uh, opens Iran up for more uh, ideological and political uh, freedom, you know. I, Absolutely. I, I, I would love to During go there. the uh, previous uh, government, Oh, serious During government? the previous government, we had dictatorship, oh, of course, yeah. but not uh, religion. Now it is dictatorship and religion together. It is unbelievable right. uh, yeah. what people are suffering. Right. Yeah, when religion gets political power, censorship seems to be the, the inevitable conclusion, is that when you have a government based around an idea that is unquestionable, like I think Scott even said this, that science has answers that That's may right. never be questioned and right. religion has questions that may never be answered. The easiest way to do that is just to, to hold on to this sort of power based on this sort of non-evidence-based faith is to legally and physically prevent people from asking those sort of questions right. and starting the conversation because it's those conversations that break down religion's power. So they try to prevent it at any cost. So anyways, it was really good to hear from you, Majid, and thank you for calling thank in. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Keep up the good work. <laughs> hey, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So let's... That was awesome. That was awesome. I was just going to say, uh, it's interesting that Majid called and he said that he is originally from Iran because, was it last week? Yes. Last week or the week before, we had someone call in from Tehran, inexplicably, who didn't have time to talk. Yeah, he, and uh, had into work. Yeah, he, had, he couldn't wait to talk to us, so that was, that's an interesting question. Yeah, it's, it's nice to know that even in a country where uh, there is that kind of control over the sort of information and opinions people are allowed to hear, that people find a way to still hear those different information. Because that's really what breaks down totalitarian mindsets, mm -hmm. period, is the ability to just be different, mm -hmm. to be different. I just want to get to the point where they're able to be different safely. Right. Uh, and sadly, there doesn't seem to be, I mean, you can't do it the George Bush way. You can't just simply go into a country, uh, someone else's country, and sort of force it by, you know, the point of a gun. Right. Um, it's going to have to come internally. That, I mean, something closer to the Green Movement, which still isn't secular, but right. I, I really do think that it's going to be the people of Iran that fix Iran. Right. And it's going to be a really, really painful, drawn-out process. And please be strong. The same thing happened under Christianity <laughs> like 500 years ago. Yeah. So it will happen. It just will be very painful. Ask <laughs> Galileo. <laughs> well, shall we move on to the topic? I know Let's we're, move right we, into we've the been topic. Burning, down the, uh, burning down the minutes here. So I wanted to talk specifically about the Synoptic Gospels. And for those of you who are mystified why atheists would want to be talking about this, I think we've said this before, um, this sort of stuff, while I don't believe a lick of it, is fascinating to me. I mean, it is, the Bible is arguably the most uh, influential book in all of Western civilization. It, it was the foundation for the most powerful and largest religion in the entire world. And when we are making criticisms on the show about theists, we're largely talking about Christians. So for us to do this and not, for us to make those criticisms and not actually understand theologically, historically, um, what the the book and the, found, the foundations, the religious foundations, would be uh, remiss. We would be remiss. So uh, I want to talk specifically about the Synoptic Gospels, which are the first four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they are uh, not only our earliest Gospels that were written, but also they are the w ones that have the basically the only, as far as we as far as we know, and as as for what we take for for granted, the only information that we have about Jesus's life. 
Um, so if, if, the, if there is information that is to be said as the closest to represent the man for whom the entire religion is based, then the first four Gospels are it. They're basically all we have, as we don't have any secular sources. Um, so what are the Gospels specifically? Well, they're the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, they were written, as I said, written closest to the life of Jesus, and they contain what might be the only likely words of the man Jesus himself. Um, and they largely inspired, they, those books themselves and the oral traditions from which they came, inspired not only the entire religion of Christianity, but they also went on to inspire the later books in the New Testament and inspired what later became the canon to make the, what we know now as the New Testament. Um, so they were alleged, the first thing to know about these things is we call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because um, the presumption is that these are actually eyewitness testimonies by disciples of the same name. Um, so, you know, if you were in a court of law, you would be, you know, and you wanted to ask someone about an incident, you would favor the person who saw it with their own eyes rather than the person who heard it from their neighbor, who heard it from someone else who saw it. So, as an, as an antiquity and as in certain places now in history, uh, and, and now in present day, um, you would favor, if you were wanting to tell someone about an incident, someone who was as, an eyewitness or as close to an eyewitness as possible. So um, there was, there's definitely, that's the, the claim behind them, the Gospels according to Matthew, the Gospel according to Luke and what have you. Um, so while these are, 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 are purported to be disinterested historical accounts, um, depending on the way you're looking at it, they are all at once a a work of ancient literature collectively, they are a biography and, and a historical record as well as theological doctrine themselves. So and depending on which context you actually want to look at them, you can speak different ways and you can find different interpretations of the way the text goes. So the, uh, the first that uh, we won't talk about at all because we're not a televangelist show, we don't, this is not our, we're not in church, this is not our job to find meaning in the, in the Gospels, um, is the theological context and that's the doctrinal basis of the Christian religion, one that contains the theological, uh, the Christology, as they would call it, about the the man himself, the divine figure Jesus, um, some sort of interpretation, interpretation or explanation as to what all this means in God's greater plan, as well as these also have predictions about what's going to happen with the, the to the future of the world. Now, these are all things that are firmly ensconced in a theological reading. Of They're the, all faith based. Right, exactly. They're all things that you. You can't take uh, you can't take the predictions when Jesus says, "I there I tell you now that there are no among you that will not taste well, that will taste death because you will see the end of the earth." That's purely a theological claim. Yeah. you can't you certainly can't test that at all. Yeah, that, how did that work out, by the way? Uh, as we'll see later, actually, the gospels the the author of the latest gospel actually had to deal with that problem. That was particularly thorny. Because I mean, as far as I can remember, the world did not end in the first century. No, <laughs> it's as far as I know. <laughs> it's, I, as far I, as I, I know, I'm not, a, I'm not a historian, but <laughs> so the still second, here. Other than theological, which we won't, obviously we won't talk about for obvious reasons, there is uh, looking at the gospels through a historical context, um, which is also somewhat fascinating for anyone who's a student of history who likes to know about what. Uh, what lives were like under different people at different times under different circumstances. So obviously this is, an, uh, this is a narrative about a people in a time and a place. First century Judeans, um, it was about largely about a Jewish community that was, um, that was sort of intertwined, that was in the Roman Empire under Roman rule. Um, and it was about, uh, it was about living in, in Mediterranean antiquity. Um, so there were all these sort of things that differ from our own perspective that are informed by history and that uh, if you read these alongside Roman historians and whatnot, you would actually have a, a, a better picture of what it was like to be in that part of the Mediterranean at that time. But in a weird sort of way, we're, we're still going to get back to the, the Sherlock Holmes Spider-Man sort of thing, is that right. just because the, it was written in that certain era and it matches a lot of things because the author is from that time and these are real places, it doesn't do anything to verify the supernatural claims in these no. stories. 